Now, if you had any issues on that one, if you made any mistakes, hopefully such mistakes won't be made when? On the test. Yeah, when the exam, yeah, when the test or the exam comes along, and that should be, it's, it's on the horizon now. It's not the end of next week, but it will probably be the following Monday. Because it will be after we complete chapter, chapter 10. Uh, now, one other side note before I get started. For those of you who are thinking of working on either the paper on free will or the one on the self and personal identity, it's probably not a bad time to get a jump start on those readings. Because we will be talking about issues connected with the problem of free will and the self and personal identity in this chapter, in chapter 10, and in chapter 11. Yes? And when is the, the essay on the problem of evil due? That was already due. That was due last, that was due on Monday. That was due on Monday, since that material was wrapped up. Anyway just to do more with Descartes. I want to talk for a few minutes where I left off last time. Now Descartes begins to do his philosophical works later on in his life. And I might add when he talks about his method, he sort of explains that he really wasn't mentally ready to work on his most important philosophical works because his mind was too clouded by the passions. And not to be too vulgar, vulgar about this, Descartes did live a life as a young man. In other words, he did what? He sowed them, as they say, because he understood that that's part of life, but you're not going to be able to think too clearly about the most important of things if your mind is clouded by the pleasures of the flesh. So he doesn't begin to do this kind of philosophical work until his later life, and by later life, around my age. You know, he's gotten all that out of his system. Now his mind is clear enough to start to do you know, his more serious work. Not that his works on science and mathematics that he did prior to this were not very serious works. Now, he writes a short book called Discourse on Method. It's mentioned in your textbook, but it's not quite laid out as much as I'd like to explain it. In his Discourse on Method, he explains not just his conception of what true ideas are, but he will talk about a method for getting to those foundational truths. Truths are those ideas they're ideas. Where do ideas exist, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, ideas exist in the mind. Ideas are not in the physical world out there. Ideas are things that exist in minds. Yeah. What is those referring to? Oh, truths are those, oh, or any ideas. That's it. Are those ideas that are known now, here's the reference to the those. Okay. Those things that I can rightfully call truth are those ideas that are known clearly and distinctly. Ideas, as we just answered, exist in minds, and things that are known clearly and distinctly These are things that we would call uh, simple concepts that are known by the mind. And he will also draw this conclusion. They are things that I understand better than I understand perceptible things, whether I'm at first aware of it or not. And they are also things that I can no longer what? They are things that have gone through a process of skeptical doubt. So much doubt, and it passes through that doubt, and I still find it 
to be true, if it passes through the gauntlet of skeptical doubt and gets through unscathed, I can say that those ideas are in fact true. Now the two things that he will, that he will and we've already talked about this, that he will reject as being able to give him truth so-called knowledge a posteriori. Now, this is a Latin term. And it means something like with reference to experience. And when I say experience, folks, I'm talking about known through the senses. Now, the simple answer to why he's going to reject this model of truth is because he recognizes, as many of you have already said, that the senses can deceive us and that we can never be certain of any of the data given to us through our senses. And this isn't Descartes, but this is me here. Even when I make the statement over there that the grass out there is green, if you understand the way the senses work, you know that greenness is not inherent to that grass. In other words, the greenness is not in the grass itself. The greenness that we experience is a mediated experience between the thing that I call grass, my eyes, and my mind, which interprets the data. Other people might experience that grass as a different color, even if they call the same thing green. If you're, another example, if your senses have ever been deceived in the past, you recognize that they could also be being deceived right now. And just one more little example, the way my senses give me the world is relative to whom? To me. Each of us experiences the world differently. And thus, Descartes will say, we cannot call what the data of our senses gives us the truth. Because if something is worthy of being called truth, and this is really important, we must be able to know it for certain. Now, most of us likely don't think about this concept of certainty very much. And it's probably because on a day-to-day -day basis, most of us don't need to know things for 100% certain. In or, that is, in order to get through my day. I don't need to be certain that there's a stop sign at, at, in front of me. Because the data of my senses is typically enough to give me enough of an idea what's going on, even if my senses might be being what? Deceived. That might have been a bad example, by the way, because I wouldn't want to be deceived that a stop sign isn't there, and there one is one there, and well, you get the idea. But yeah, for Descartes, anything that is worthy of being called knowledge is something that can be known for certain. And by definition, the knowledge of our senses cannot be known for certain. Now the other thing that he's going to reject as a source of truth will be truths as conveyed by authorities. Now this is the remark he makes. I went to some of the best schools in all of Europe. Had some of the allegedly most knowledgeable people teaching me. But when I went out and explored the world for myself and did experiments and thought through things on my own, I found out that the alleged authorities were what, often? Wrong. Yeah, they were often wrong about things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we do have to put our trust in authorities. But it would be a mistake to believe that certain truth claims were indeed true only on the grounds of an authority figure saying it. 
Especially given that I've got a what? I've got a rational mind. And each and every one of you has a rational mind. This is the bold individualistic step made by Descartes. This is why he is considered to be one of the first and most profound of the modern philosophers. Because what he will articulate here is that truth is discovered by minds. So the starting point is in fact the rational individual who through the careful use of her reasoning finds out what the absolute truths are. And by the way, folks, truth is not a matter of opinion. He is talking about the proper direction of your rational mind in order to find truths that can no longer be doubted. Now this method that he uses, and then we'll talk about applying it, It is called methodic doubt. You might also hear it called Descartes' method of doubt. You may also hear some old school philosophers calling it hyperbolic doubt. Now if you know what hyperbole is as a, as a rhetorical device, it is a gross exaggeration. Now the reason why some old school philosophers used to call it hyperbolic doubt is because they understood that this is the kind of doubt that we use for what purpose and what pur purpose alone. We use it for methodical purposes. To use this kind of doubt in everyday life would be kind of silly. It would get us nowhere. As a matter of fact, it probably wouldn't have gotten me here today if I were to use this kind of radical doubt. It is radical doubt to plumb the depths of what can and cannot be known for purposes of method. Now what methodic doubt contends is that if you want to find truths that are known clearly and distinctly, you have to take said truth claim and subject it to what? Yeah. Subjected to the most extreme of death. And if it is able to get through the most extreme of doubt, we can say that it is therefore true. Now before I get to Descartes' meditations where he applies this method philosophically, I would like to talk about Descartes' model of truth. <clears throat> And it's because if a student reads Descartes' meditations without having an understanding about what his project is, it seems like the ravings of a madman. If you understand the context of why he's doing what he's doing, you might be able to take him just a little bit more seriously. Now you won't just see this in the text, this is, a, uh, this is common terminology among philosophers. Descartes' theory of truth is called the coherence theory. Descartes models truth on what is called a coherence theory of truth. And I'm not going to write this on the board, but I'll say, say it slowly. According to the coherence theory, a truth claim is true if and only if it fits in coherently with the body of truths that have already been rationally established. A truth claim is true if and only if it is consistent or coherent with the body of truths that have rationally already been established. Now can you take a guess what kind of disciplines that you have encountered in your 
schooling that actually use a model of truth that is a coherence model. And by the way, if I give you the answer, you shouldn't be surprised after. Mathematics. He nailed it. Mathematics and our mathematically based sciences work off of coherence models of truth. And just to lay out what a coherence model does is, we start with what kind of principles? What we do is we begin with self-evident principles. Principles that we have an understanding of how. We understand them conceptually. These are our fundamental truths. And to use some other philosophical language, these fundamental truths are foundational. Because just like the foundation of a house, if the foundation is not firm, anything else you stick on it will will crumble. The idea is a body of truth must be built on a solid foundation of indisputable truths. And to carry on with the mathematical example that Mr. Shepard mentioned, I know most of you have to take geometry at some point or another. But they probably didn't make you read Euclid. I am neither bragging nor anything else, but I was forced to read Euclid and guess what kind of a class? Geometry. No. A graduate level philosophy course as an illustration of how correspondence models work. Yeah, read Euclid in a philosophy class. I also read Newton. Because Newtonian physics is also based upon a coherence model. Guess what both Euclid and Newton do near the beginnings of their work of derivations? They begin by clearly defining their terms and their relationships to one another. Those are the foundations of both Euclidean geometry as well as the foundations of Newtonian physics. Clear definitions of things like mass, force, acceleration, and so forth in Newton. Clear definitions of points, lines, angles, and so forth. And the thing is, once you have clear and distinct definitions, and these definitions are concepts that are supposed to, you're supposed to have where? You're supposed to understand them in your mind. Now the idea is, once you have the foundations down, you can use what to derive further truths? The idea is that you use your rational capabilities to derive further truths. And those further truths will be entirely based upon what? Your foundational assumptions. Now, if you haven't screwed up in your derivation, you can say what for sure? Whatever you derive rationally from your foundational truths must also be what? True. Whatever you derive from your foundational truths must also be true. Some of us, as adults, I'll admit, I hated geometry when I was in high school. I hated calculus. And it was partly because all I was doing was mimicking. You know, you know what I mean? I was cookbooking, 
I'm willing to go on camera saying this, by the way. The reason why my education in high school, as well as in a lot of my college career, in mathematics as well as in uh, the mathematically based sciences, was in my opinion substandard, is because they more or less just force us to rote memorize how to go through things. And I never really was, and I'm not proud of this. I didn't understand anything. But I could go through the motions by rote. Unfortunately, that cultivates entire generations of people who might be able to, what is it they call it, monkey see, monkey do, but they really don't understand what or why they're doing it. And I found this happened to my daughter in high school calculus too. And it makes me rather mm, not happy. It makes me unhappy. Because take a guess when I came to appreciate things like geometry and calculus. After I took a course in philosophy of science, where we actually learned about things like this, the idea that these are systems of truth, and that we are rationally deriving truths from foundational truths, and that if we go through our steps methodically, and that we always verify that we're allowed to make the step that we make, due to principles that have already been established, that every single step you take will be one that will get you to a further truth. I'll give you another example. 